In this video, I want to conclude the material about absorption and stripping by talking about what happens when we have concentrated systems. And this is going to conclude the material from chapter 12 of Wonkot. So thus far in the course, we've talked about what happens when we have dilute systems. And to remind you of what that means, that means that the amount of solute that we have in the liquid or vapor that's fed to the system is small enough that we can assume that the flow rates of liquid and vapor are approximately constant. And we call those capital L and V, which is the molar flow rate of liquid into the system or the molar flow rate of vapor into the system. And if we can assume that, then it's possible to do a graphical design to determine the concentration leaving each stage and also calculate the number of stages required to get to a given level of separation. And that's with the McCabe Thiele diagram. And we've talked about that. It's very similar to what we do for distillation, although of course we don't have a separate feed and we don't have two operating lines, we only have one. So it's a little bit simpler. Um, also, I've talked about a simplifying case where if the equilibrium thermodynamic data are linear between y and x, then we can derive an equation called the Kremser equation that describes for dilute systems how many stages we need and what the composition is leaving an absorber or a stripper. Now, if the system is not dilute, we call it concentrated. And what we mean by that is that the liquid and vapor flow rates are expected to vary because of the amount of solute that gets transferred from one system to another. An obvious case of this would be, for example, if there's 10% solute in the feed in a liquid phase, for example. So if we're supposed to remove like 90% of that or, or even more, we're going to reduce the liquid flow rate to 90% of what it was. So we would expect that that's going to have a significant impact on the slope of the operating line. If that's true, the approach is usually that we can assume that the carrier gas and carrier solvent flow rates are constant. And we can only do that as long as the carrier gas doesn't dissolve into the carrier liquid. And we can assume that the liquid doesn't evaporate into the gas phase. And so we're going to define a capital S to be just the carrier solvent flow rate. So for example, if it's an aqueous solution, S would be the flow rate of just the water. So not counting whatever solutes dissolved. And in the gas phase, we define a capital G to be the flow rate, the molar flow rate of just the carrier gas. And that might just be air in a situation where we're using air to strip a component out of water, for example. But we're gonna assume that both of those are constant. So there's no exchange between the two carrier phases. So if that's true, we can take the same material balances that we had before. And here's an illustration of the control volume that we would use for absorption. Actually, we use it for both types of operations, but we start at the top of the column and we draw this control volume that goes from the top of the column to a certain stage. And it's identified as stage J, where we have vapor going in from stage J plus one and liquid leaving stage J. And if that's true, we can express this balance in a slightly different form than what I did before, which is here, which is to say that the liquid flow rate of solute of B leaving stage zero, or sorry, entering stage zero. So this is what gets fed. So that corresponds to what's going in in this stream. That liquid flow rate of solute in that stream plus the flow rate of vapor that's entering of the same solute entering from below is balanced by what's leaving stage J, which is this term. And it's getting a little messy. I don't want to mess it up too much, but I guess I'll try to draw this. That's this stream that we're talking about. And then finally, we have the vapor that's leaving the top of the column which is also the output from this control volume of solute, which is here. So if we have all of those things, we can define our material balance that way. And if we do that, and then we take the total flow rates of the liquid and vapor, and we take the mole fractions in each stream, we can derive our operating line, which is what we've done before for absorption and stripping. So it gives this equation, where if it's dilute, it makes sense because L and V are constant to express Y as a function of X. So we have Y for stage J plus one as a function of X for stage J. These terms define an intercept for that operating line and they are constant because it's terms having to do with what's at the top of the column and that doesn't change from stage to stage. And L over V defines the slope of the operating line. 
Now, if we don't want to work in terms of L and V and lowercase x and y, so we don't use mole fractions, we can instead express the flow rate of solute leaving stage J in the liquid phase as the solvent flow rate multiplied by the molar ratio of solute to solvent in the liquid phase. And we express that with a capital X. Notice this is different from the lowercase x, so capital X here represents the mole ratio of solute to solvent in the liquid phase. And in a similar way, we can express the molar flow rate of solute in the vapor phase, lowercase v, for stage J, to be the total um, carrier gas flow rate multiplied by the mole ratio of solute to carrier gas. And that's a capital Y instead of being a lowercase y. So if we write our material balance that way, we can derive an expression which is again an operating line, but now it's in terms of mole ratios instead of mole fractions. And that's what we're going to use for concentrated systems because it relates the, con the composition of the gas phase, now it's a mole ratio leaving stage J plus one to the mole ratio leaving stage J and the slope of that relationship is S over G which now is the flow rate of just the carrier solvent to just the carrier gas. So it's not the total liquid and the total vapor flow rate but just the carrier solvent and the carrier gas that appear there. And then these terms are all constant also. So that, that represents an intercept on a plot, which would be capital X. Click there to move on. Um, so we basically do the exact same thing that we've always done with, with the mccabe thiele diagram for these concentrated systems. But instead of working in terms of mole fractions, we work in terms of mole ratios. And as long as we're talking a system, about a system where we only have one solute, it's easy to calculate these mole ratios. So in the liquid phase, the mole ratio of solute leaving stage J is the mole fraction over one minus the mole fraction because one minus the mole fraction is the fraction of solvent in that phase. And then capital Y for stage J is lowercase y, so the mole fraction over one minus the mole fraction. So the mole ratios are straightforward to calculate and we then make a plot of capital Y versus capital X um, in order to do our calculations and we treat it exactly the same way as we would for dilute systems where we can do things like um, draw these these lines going from the operating line to the equilibrium curve and back again to define all of our stages so we can find the composition that's leaving every stage and the number of stages required to get our separation to work just using this um, McCabe Thiele diagram now one thing that we have to do is to recalculate our equilibrium data. So normally we express equilibrium in terms of mole fractions because thermodynamically that makes the most sense. So we need to take whatever information we have and translate every mole fraction into a mole ratio in both the liquid and the gas phase. And in the book, example 12-3 illustrates doing this um, for a particular problem. That's what this graph actually represents and that gives this um, set of equilibrium data that's here. Now actually it looks like a straight line. It isn't a perfect straight line. This is actually an example where there's a pretty good straight line between lowercase y and x, but it translates into a reasonably straight line for the equilibrium data. The operating line, and sorry I, I forgot to change the notation here, it has a constant slope, which I wrote as L prime over V prime because that represents the carrier free liquid flow rate over the carrier, sorry, solvent solute free vapor flow rate. In the terms of the notation I just introduced, that should be um, the solvent flow rate over the carrier gas flow rate. But that's the slope of the operating line, which is drawn here. And that operating line also should pass through points that represents the mole ratios in streams that pass each other. So the point on this end has to do with the mole ratio leaving the top of the column um, in the, the gas phase and the mole ratio in the liquid that's entering the column. And at this end of the operating line, we have the mole ratio of the gas that's going into the bottom of the column, because this is an absorption column, and then the mole ratio in the liquid that's leaving the column, which is Xn in this case. And by counting off stages, we can find out how many stages are required. We can also find the minimum solvent flow rate for an absorber based on a pinch point, which is the dashed line here. It's here, I know I'm making this messy by emphasizing all these lines, but this is the line that can be used for the minimum 
uh, solve flow rate. And if you want all the details about this problem, you can look at example 12-3 in order to find out more about how that works. Now similarly for a stripping column, if it's concentrated, we do the exact same thing. So it looks the same as it always has. Um, and now we just work in terms of mole ratios instead of mole fractions. So again, we'll have an equilibrium curve that's illustrated here. And we'll have to take what information, whatever information we're given and potentially translate that into a series of mole ratios. And we draw our operating line, which has a constant slope, which still has the same value of solvent flow rate over gas, carrier gas flow rate. That's the slope of that operating line. And we identify the points that represent the mole ratios at the top and bottom of the column. And we can count off how many stages are required in order to do a given separation. In this case, four stages are needed. One, two, three, and four in order to get this separation to happen. And still we can see what happens. This dashed line that's here represents calculating the minimum gas flow rate that would be needed to do the separation by increasing the slope of the operating line until it touches the equilibrium curve. So everything works exactly the same as it would if we were work working in terms of mole fractions, except we just have to replace the axes and all of our calculations using mole ratios. And if we do that, we have a constant slope for our operating line, and so everything looks the same as it did before. Now the last thing I want to mention is that we're not limited to ideal separations. So just as we did for distillation, we can handle non-ideal behavior, meaning stages that don't reach equilibrium every time that the vapor and liquid pass each other in two different ways. One is using an overall efficiency, which is to use a McCabe Thiele diagram or the Kremser equation for a dilute system and estimate the ideal number of stages that would be required, and that's if every stage reaches equilibrium. And then we use an overall efficiency to calculate the actual number of stages where the overall efficiency is the ideal number of stages divided by the actual number of stages. So experimentally, we could find out what the actual number of stages gives us and compare that to the ideal situation and use that to estimate an overall efficiency but there are correlations for this too. So we could look it up or we might be told what the value is for a given homework problem. So that's one approach. A different and independent approach is to use Murphy efficiencies, where if you remember from distillation, that means that we start on the operating line and we move towards the equilibrium curve, but we don't go the whole way. So we just move a fraction of the distance, again, from the operating line towards the equilibrium curve. And if we're moving in the vertical direction, that represents the vapor phase, and we use the Murphy vapor efficiency to determine what fraction we move in that direction. So to illustrate that, if we have, and this could be for either mole fractions or mole ratios, I'll talk about a dilute system where we're using mole fractions, and we have equilibrium data that might look like this, and say an operating line for an absorber that looks like this, the idea would be, and it's actually easiest to visualize if we start at the top, if this represents the whole distance from the operating line to the equilibrium curve, so equilibrium is here, and the operating line is here, if this is the whole distance for this stage, and we say have 50% Murphy vapor efficiency, I only go halfway, so I left my cursor there too long, I only go halfway and I, I draw my stage. And then if I go to the next stage, that would represent the entire distance, but I only go halfway of that distance and come back to the operating line. And I keep doing that same thing for every stage. So that's what it would look like. And then if I'm using a Murphy liquid efficiency, I do something similar, but I'm moving in the horizontal direction. So I'm going to go a fraction of the distance from the operating line to the equilibrium curve in the X direction. So that's how we handle non-ideal behavior for these systems. And that's everything I wanted to say about chapter 12, and that's all you need to know. So if you want to see more, check out Wonkot. Um, he does discuss in more detail what the operating lines look like and how to handle more situations. But that's all you need to know for this course.